Welcome, everyone. Hey, Charlie, are you really up for this? We'll find out. <laughs> okay, 1971, there can be no heckling, okay? No, oh, come on. No heckling. Oh. The guy I'm a little underprepared in terms of hardware. Hard be, Scott. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I want to uh, give a special welcome to all of our alumni and our parents and our friends who are here with us tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jen Bradley. I am the Director of Alumni and Parent Relations and Mercersburg Class of 1999. <laughs> so tonight we'll hear from Charlie Bell, Mercersburg Class of 1971, about his 10,000 mile run around the perimeter of the US. Uh, for many, Charlie needs no introduction. And in fact, he asked me not to make a fuss. So I'm going to keep this very brief. Charlie is celebrating his 50th reunion this year. And he's been a long and loyal servant to Mercersburg Academy, recently completing 12 years of service on our Board of Regents. We're also joined by two other well-known Mercersburg community members who also probably don't need very much of an introduction known by many, uh, and they're gonna be helping Charlie moderate the session and he's asked to introduce them. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this session. So if you're uncomfortable with being on camera, you can just turn your video off. Uh, we'd also like to ask that at least initially you keep yourself on mute to avoid any disruptions or heckling. I think uh, Jim and Sue will give us instructions on, on when we can ask our questions. Um, you can use the Q&A feature uh, to share your questions or at some point you may be called on to unmute yourself. So thank you, Charlie, for being a part of our Distinguished Reunion Speaker Series and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, Jen and Denise Bennett, especially for um, doing all the hard work behind the scenes. Um, and Jen, I think probably, I hope everybody who's tuned in here tonight knows how much you've done for reunions and how much of a pain <laughs> last year and this year, and who knows what next year will look like. Um, but on, you know, on behalf of my classmates, especially, uh, who were hoping to come back for our 50th we realize how disruptive this was and yet you've done everything you can to, to bring us together and it's been a great help. Uh, as Jen said, I volunteered to introduce Jim and Sue. Uh, I didn't wanna go through and, and to introduce myself in a way, I didn't wanna run through all the, uh, the uh, sort of name, rank and serial number thing, but instead just to say this, that when, when I was invited to talk I said, I would really, really like Jim and Sue to be the people to uh, sort of host things. And the reason for that is not only that they're two of my best friends at Mercersburg, and we've known each other for a long, long time. They've hosted me for twice a year for the last 12 years when I crash in town, because uh, I don't bring a tent these days. But the main thing was two, the two of them are people that I really admire. And I, am, I just wanna tell you what I admire most about them. For the last couple of weeks, I've been wanting to say that of all the runners I've ever met, Sue Malone is the one that I most admire. I admire what she's accomplished and I think she's the most accomplished. Unfortunately, it came to mind just within the last couple of days that in fact, uh, I have met Charlie Moore who won the Olympics, class of 43, Eight. something like that. And a gold medal is, is pretty good. I also have met a guy named Don Cabral, who was a steeplechaser back in, uh, in, in the Olympics in, in 2012 and in 2016. He didn't medal, but he's, he's an incredible guy. But I just met him at a reception one time. And then um, over the phone in the last year or so, I've uh, had a couple of conversations with a guy named Dave McGillivray, who has um, been the race director for the Boston Marathon for years and years and years. He's actually run across the country. He's run from Boston to the, the Keys. Um, and every year after the marathon is over, he runs the whole marathon. And now he's in his 60s. And I, I, I admire that. But I still come back to Sue. And um, younger alums know her and Jim very, very well. But people in my vintage might not know why I would say Sue is somebody I admire so much. And when it comes to running, she's still out there doing 10 and 15 milers just for fun whenever she can. She has run 
in the Grand Canyon, rim to rim to rim, uh, which by itself is pretty mind boggling. She's run the Western States 100. Um, she's gone you know, down to Washington and back, all these amazing things. Uh, and she retired last, last June. And the first thing she did was uh, tell Jim to kind of hold down the fort and went out and started on the Pacific Crest Trail, which is the single most challenging hiking, running trail that there is in the whole of North America. She will be finishing it up this summer, um, but it, it, it's just hard for me to believe. Yes, I ran a long way. It was a year and a half. And since then, I've gone back to uh, normal stuff. But Sue's, Sue's accomplishments just leave me in awe. And the fact that she stayed with it, uh, she's somebody that every runner should look up to. Jim is not quite the same runner that she is, but uh, what he is, is a, is a teacher whom, again, I've admired for, for many years. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he teaches a lot of different things, mostly physics and math, but he can teach uh, engine mechanics. I won't take up, I could probably fill up the hour talking about Jim's teaching and knowledge, general, uh, general awareness. In the, in the summer times, in his spare time, he, he works in a local auto shop. But what impressed me most about him was um, <clears throat> about two years ago, uh, I visited one of his classes. And I walked into the classroom, sat in the back quietly as he was going through things. And every so often, he would go up on the board and, and put another tick mark on the whiteboard. You know, he's doing one of those, I forget what you call it, one, two, three, four, five, counting things, tallies. And uh, near the end of class, he erased about 20 of these tally marks that were on the board. And above them, there was a, a number that I believe at that point was something like 574. And he changed it to 594. And what I found out was that this was his way of tracking the mistakes that he made through the course of the year. He kept a running tally of the times he misspoke or didn't hear somebody's question right, on and on and on. And when we talked about, I mean, I didn't really need his explanation because I've, I taught for 32 years. But what I remembered was for 32 years, I tried to think of a way to get my students not to be fearful of making mistakes. And I never came up with as good a solution as, as Jim did. I don't know how long it took him. But that sort of curiosity, that sort of self-awareness, and that sort of playfulness are things that, um, that, that I admire deeply. And uh, besides that, Jim has a good sense of humor about it all. But I did want to get those things out at the beginning because they're people who are my generation who have no idea who Jim and Sue Malone were. And uh, it's really important for me to tell them right here, look you in the eye and let you know just how much you mean to me as a friend, but also as, as role models. That said, I will give you my brief version of an introduction. But before I do that, I want to raise a question. <clears throat> and this, is, this is, may sound strange, but even when I'm <clears throat> on stage rather than in a Zoom call, excuse me. Even when I'm on stage, I begin my talk not by talking about myself or my run, but by saying this. I would much rather that you spend the next 45 or 50 minutes thinking about the answer to a question that I'm going to ask you, then listen to what I have to say. If you sincerely, authentically think deeply or in sort of a frivolous way about the answer to this question, while I'm up here blabbing away with whatever I have to say, even here on this Zoom call, um, I will turn off the Zoom call or walk off the stage a happy man uh, because I feel that I will have done something important. And the question I'm gonna ask you is this, what would you do if you had two years to do whatever you wanted to do? Pretend just for the sake of conversation that money is no expense, that whatever responsibilities you have, you, you don't have, we'll take care of them. But what is it that you'd wanna do with your life? You can divide those two years into you know, two big projects. You can do a different thing every month for 24 months. You can break it into six month chunks, but however you wanna do it, what would you do with time and energy and freedom? I love talking to teenagers more than anybody else. So I like talking to high school students and college students. 
but no matter what age you are, I hope you think about, you know, what would you do if, if you could do whatever you wanted to do? And if you're at a point where, man, you, you know, things are kind of limited, you're, you're old or whatever, ask other people this question. Ask your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, get them to think about this because as you'll see, and as you know, because you know a little bit about the talk, that's sort of what got me going. So as an introduction, I'll just say this. Um, when, I was, when I was born, my dad was a coach at Williams College. He coached three seasons of sports. Uh, when I was one year old, we moved to the Hotchkiss School where dad became the athletic director and football coach. Uh, I was just a little faculty bat, brat running around on campus. When I, was, uh, when I was 10 years old, we moved to Mercersburg. My dad was a, a huge admirer of Bill Fowle. Uh, Bill and Tony were some of my parents' closest friends. And uh, along with a couple other teachers, uh, they welcomed Bill's invitation to come down to Mercersburg. So that's where I ended up going, uh, even though I'd sort of had my, my mind set on another place, another path. Uh, I had a great time in Mercersburg for four years. I'll talk more maybe later about some of the teachers there. Uh, after Mercersburg, I took a gap year in England, which is a great thing. Uh, if you have anybody in that place in life, encourage them to take a gap year now more than ever, just having time to sort of explore different things. That's sort of like that two year question, but in a different point in your life. But again, a gap year is a great thing for me. It was wonderful. Went back to college, four years of college, uh, got a job. Luckily, I got a very high paying job. Uh, my dad and mom were teachers. We didn't have any, any money coming from, from uh, mysterious places. So I had to pay back my debts, but I was an engineer in college, even though I was designated as the class poet at graduation. So it was a, a bit hard to uh, put in a box. But anyway, uh, I went to work in New York for IBM when IBM was the greatest company in the world. And uh, my office was at the corner of Madison Avenue and 42nd Street. So there I was uh, living Upper East Side and then later commuting. And about uh, a year and a half into that, I was, spending a weekend out in the country in Connecticut with my sister and her husband. And I was standing on a train platform in Fairfield, Connecticut on Sunday evening, waiting to take the train to go back into the city. And I said to myself, I don't really wanna to go to work tomorrow. And I'm gonna pause here for the first and maybe the last interactive part of this. And so we need to go to, is it the chat where you get to put up your hand? No, um, where do you get to sh show of hands, Jen? I think you can do reactions. Reactions, uh, yes, let's go to reactions. So click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. And if you've ever had a Sunday evening thought, I don't wanna go to work tomorrow, or I don't wanna do homework, I don't wanna go to school, whatever it is, Sunday night thoughts, if you've ever had that click with the uh, hand up and uh, you, just, you just give a thumbs up or a hand or raise your hand and uh, don't worry, it'll disappear in uh, a few seconds. So that's all we wanna do. <laughs> so there I was standing on the train platform, but the funny thing was, instead of saying to myself, well, I've gotta go to work tomorrow, I realized I didn't have to go to work tomorrow. For the first time in my life, uh, I was able to support myself. I had paid off my college loans very quickly because I was very frugal and I was making a lot of money for me, certainly. Um, and I thought, what, what could I do if I didn't go to work tomorrow? I mean, literally, if I just didn't show up, what would I want to do? And I started thinking about the things that I really wanted to do in life. And one of them was to write, but no matter where I went, what I did, I could write. So that wasn't even something I had to worry about. Another thing I thought about was, well, I thought about a lot of things. I thought about, I'd learned, like to learn to play an instrument. If Richard Rotz is watching, I had him for a, a teacher at James Buchanan Junior High School. Uh, I never learned to play an instrument. That would be fun. Learn to get good at French. I, was, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't fluent by a long shot. Uh, parachute, uh, read all the great books, uh, hitchhike wherever I could. And the things that I kept coming back to is I wanted to write I wanted to see the United States because I'd seen a lot of Europe in my gap year. I'd gone to England and, and traveled around Europe on a Eurail pass. And the third thing that really mattered was running. 
uh, all through Mercersburg in college, I'd been a very indifferent athlete. In fact, a pretty uh, pathetic one. If, if Rick Hendrickson's on the phone, I, on, the, uh, on the line, I'll be happy to talk about my <laughs> awful career at Hotchkiss, but I, at Mercersburg, excuse me, but I tried, uh, but didn't have much success. But I'd taken up marathon running when I got out of college and had gotten hooked on that. And there was that, I don't know, whether it was macho or suppressed uh, competitiveness or something, but I wondered how good I could be if I just devoted myself to running for years and years and years. And I thought maybe I could qualify for the Olympics or at least the Olympic trials, but there was this, this sort of yearning to figure out just how good I could be in a sport that I finally realized I might have some, some talent for. Um, if Lynn Anderson, classmate is on the line, he was a cross country runner. He was number one when I was in school. And I always thought I could never do that, but I started getting interested in it. Anyway, standing on the train platform, I got these two ideas. I wanted to, to see the United States and I wanted to see how good a marathoner I could become in several years. So I put those two things together and I decided, oh, I'm gonna buy a van. You know, everybody had a VW van back then if they were kind of freewheeling hippie types. I wasn't that, but it would work. And I thought I'd get in a van, drive all around the country and every day I would do my workouts for maybe a year or two and then I could go to a mountaintop somewhere and write about my travels. Travels by Charlie rather than travels with Charlie. And uh, then I started thinking about it and said, geez, you know, that's gonna cost gas money. It's gonna, you know, the car could break down. And then I thought also I could roll into a small town nowhere. Let's call it, uh, give it a name, Greencastle. Um, Greencastle, USA. I'd walk, walk into town, maybe go to a diner or a bar early afternoon just to sit down and cool off. And, and, and then I thought I'd start a conversation with somebody and say, uh, this is really interesting, but excuse me, I got to go run 15 miles because I'm I got got to do my workout and it just seemed very awkward and with that I thought oh I know what I'll do I'll run from place to place and that'd be perfect if I ran in the morning and ran in the afternoon then I'd have uh, you know the 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 time in between to chat with people and that might work out better so I thought okay I'll run from Delaware to um, to California and that would be cool. And then I thought, okay, so what's gonna happen when I get to California? Family will come out, maybe some friends, and I'll dive into the Pacific and come out and there might be a reporter and give an interview. And then what would I do? I'd get on a plane and fly back to Washington and go back up to Mercerburg. And that just seemed like so artificial because when Sue or I go out for runs or anybody goes out for a run, you don't go five or 10 miles and have somebody drive you home or something. You, you do a loop. And with that, I got this idea. I thought, man, if I did the perimeter of the country, I would cover so much more ground. It would be pi times as much distance, I guess. Um, I'd be able to, to see much more variety. It would last longer. I'd have more to see and think and remember. And then I did a quick calculation about being able to follow the seasons and suddenly it was, it was almost like a, a, seeing a weather map of the United States, the little blinking light starting at Mercersburg and I could follow the seasons south in the fall, through the desert in the winter, up the west coast in the springtime, back across the plains in the warmest part of the year, circle New England in the fall and be home by Christmas. And with that idea, that epiphany, I thought, man, I've got to do that. In fact, if I don't do that the rest of my life, I'm going to wonder why not. That's how it started. Now, at this point, I can go in a hundred different directions. I could tell you what I think was interesting, what was important. I could give a little speech or a long speech, short, medium, long. long. I could go on through, through the night. I allowed myself only one night per month in a motel. So 29 days a month, I was trying to find shelter. I had a backpack. Maybe you've seen the website, pictures of me running with a backpack. You can see the backpack over my shoulder here. Uh, I can show it to you later. But rather than me do the selecting and try to figure out what you might be interested in, I would much rather right now, starting now with Jim and Sue uh, as sort of hosts and, and moderators, 
I'd like to hear what things go through your mind. You might want to ask about logistics. You might want to ask about uh, plans, about my thinking. You may have heard that I've written a book about it, uh, which I'm now after 40 years of work. That's probably an, an open question. Uh, why did it take so long? Um, how it changed me. What was it like? You could try some superlatives. What was the scariest, funniest, loneliest, biggest surprise, on and on and on. But again, rather than shape the narrative myself, I'd much rather hear what, what's on your minds when you, when you hear about this thing. So with that, you can either um, raise your hand try to, to try to get people's attention, or, or you can put something in the chat and Jim and Sue will, will be happy to answer questions. And rather than have a talk, um, it'll feel a little bit more like a conversation, even though I'm the one that'll kind of carry the load. Um, I'm also not going to be looking in the gallery because I would just be going, oh, 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 it's great to see you. Um, but I will say, because they happen to be right front and center, Walter and Barbara Bergen, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, you have done great things for me, some of which you know about and some of which you don't. And I thank you. Yeah, we would like to encourage people to type questions into the chat and we will sort of select them and call on people to ask them, ask them to unmute and call them. Charlie, I'm interested in whether or not you still run now. And if so, about how much do you run in an average week? I run almost not at all. Um, as you... <laughs> Me too. You're my role model, Jim. There I go. Um, After all these years. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things about the trip was that about three quarters of the way around, I, uh, I got an injury. Uh, Sue knows about this and some other people do, but coming over the Cascades in Washington, uh, one of my knees that had been giving me a little bit of uh, a, bit of a little tweaky, naggy thing going downhill for about eight or 10 miles. Uh, when I got to the bottom, it just felt different. And at that point I said, well, if it gets worse, I'll see a doctor. If it gets better, I'll uh, start running again. And it stayed the same. So I really didn't do a lot of running for the, I pretty much walked the last 4,000 miles. Um, when I got, I could do I that. got home and, and rested a little bit, I started training again, but found that I could never push myself the way I used to. And I ran one more marathon about three years later. And that was actually the, the Marine Corps Marathon in Washington with among other people, Sue Malone and Frank Rutherford. And uh, Frank's fun because all the younger, all the younger alums know him, but he was uh, class of 70. So uh, my guy should remember him too. Aaron, would you like to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? That's a really good question. Aaron Walsh Kirkman. Hi. Hi, Aaron. Um, hi, nice to meet you. So I just, for uh, coming. yeah, I just had a question about how did you hydrate and how did you get enough nutrition for that kind of distance on your own? And I suppose you were unsupported and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, good question. Basic logistics. Um, I just had to drink as much water as I could. Uh, I had a, a sack of water. Um, in fact, for, to get some of the logistics taken care of Denise, if you could put up the picture that's entitled shaving stuff. Um, I had a water sack that I could put as much water into as I needed, but the more water I carried, the heavier it was and the slower I'd be. It really was only a problem when I was crossing the desert. You can see from that picture, there's the water sack on the left, which if I emptied it out, was had almost nothing. Um, I had a little bunch of toiletries, a towel. Back in the back right pic corner of the picture, you can see my uh, sleeping bag, a blue sleeping bag, and a, uh, a green tube tent. Um, so that was that was about it. The whole thing weighed about 25, 20 pounds or so. Um, if I had a lot of water, it was, it was going to go up to about 25. Um, but the only place I always had to know where the next water faucet was, especially when I got to the desert. And the hardest crossing there was 60 miles without water. And the first time I had a, a day like that, it was miserable. And I didn't plan well enough. And I was out of water by middle of the night and had to go 30 miles the next day um, without water, but <laughs> I, uh, I went slowly. I learned my lesson. In terms yeah. of food, all I really need was, I needed a lot of starch. I just needed as many calories I could get. 
And the hard thing was chewing through whatever I was chewing through. So my favorite thing to buy was saltines. I would crush them into a powder and then chug them because that was the easiest way to get hundreds of calories into me every day. Uh, and, and I never had any problems with, with eating. That's pretty fantastic considering all of the technology and uh, the dozens of bars and, and nutrition that, that are currently in my cabinets uh, just to help gonna, us. I'm going to jump into one funny thing there. One of, one of the most memorable meals was I was uh, sitting in a, a little porch in uh, a town called Bell City, Louisiana. I really had to stop there because of the name. Um, but the next town was another 15, 20 miles anyway. So I stopped at Bell City, population about 400, and was sitting on the, on the uh, steps of a grocery store near a country store, uh, eating my crackers and watching the sun go down. And up you know, out of the door came a, a guy and his son. It sort of looked like a farmer. And they'd gone in to get some groceries a few minutes before. And uh, I was just sitting there and sort of nodded to them. And uh, the man said, so how's the hitching? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not hitchhiking. I'm, I'm actually running. He said, what are you running from? Which was a common <laughs> joke. But we talked for a little while and he found out that that I had run from Pennsylvania to Louisiana by way of much of Florida. And uh, he just stared at me for a second. He looked at my shoes, which were beaten up from 1500 miles or so, looked at my clothes, which were just caked with sweat. And uh, I was pretty clean cut, but clearly I had sweat and saliva stains all over me. And he looked at me for a moment he said, how'd you like to put away them crackers and come home and have some good South Louisiana gumbo? <laughs> so yeah. I said, sure, that'd be, that'd be great. And this actually happened often, that people invited me home after some conversation, if it was the right time of day. Uh, I said, what about your wife? What's she going to say? She said, oh, don't mind her. She, I bring home strays, strays all the time. <laughs> so I went in. As soon as I got in the door, Mrs. Frugé was wonderful. Joe, oh, it was Norman Frugé and his son, Andre, and his, his wife, Joanne. And they said, uh, I, I just walked in the door and she said, oh, we're happy to have you. Uh, wouldn't you love a shower? Oh. <laughs> she, she ran, got me a towel. I took a shower, had this magnificent meal of, of gumbo, Louisiana okra shrimp gumbo, just fresh Gulf shrimp. And everything. I mean, it was one of the best meals I ever had. And during the meal, they introduced me to their oldest daughter, who was not living with them anymore. Um, she was married, and she was, I want to say, literally nine months pregnant because her, her, she was about two days past due. I thought for a second they wanted a shotgun, uh, shotgun wedding and set me up with her or something, but her husband was there too. And uh, indeed, she was due to have the baby any minute. Anyway, I went to bed. Next morning, uh, the phone rang pretty early, and it was Denise, and she's gone into labor. So... Mrs. Fruget said, um, Norman's going to be out of work. I'm going to the hospital. Uh, Andre's going to go with some neighbors. Uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you meet us at the hospital? Because <laughs> it's right on your route. So that's what I did. I put on the backpack and ran 20 miles to the next town, found my way to the hospital, went up to the maternity ward, and was there in the waiting room when Denise and Matt went into the delivery area, sort of, hello, here we go, and waited around a couple hours. In the meantime, they told me to call my parents and tell them I was in a delivery room, in a maternity ward. <laughs> my parents said, wait, you've only been on the road for like five months. What's, what's up with that? And uh, sure enough, uh, about you know, a couple hours later, a uh, nurse came to the door of the maternity ward and said, uh, the Fruget family should come here. We have a little surprise for you. And so they got up and, and I was, you know, excited for it. And they said, no, no, you're part of the family now. So there I was with these people who were total strangers 24 hours before in the hospital with them when their first grandchild was born. Um, didn't happen every night, but it was amazing what did happen along the way. And the funny thing about that, of course, is that I haven't told you, but the town was Bell City. The hospital was Lake Charles. So we've got Charlie Bell and Lake <laughs> Charles and Bell City. All this happened a few weeks before Christmas, sort of no room at the inn, you know, babe in swaddling clothes and all that stuff. Um, and it, it seemed miraculous. 
Mm. But the, the miracle of it to me wasn't just all these wonderful coincidences, but the fact that it wouldn't have happened if Mr. Fruget hadn't stopped and talked to me and invited me in. That's a pretty wonderful story. Bill Sutherland, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I wanted to know what, what your parents had to say on your way out. <laughs> um, well, they were, they were very supportive. They were wonderfully supportive. The hard part was breaking the news to them in the first place because uh, I had this great job, had paid off my loans, was living in New York. And then suddenly I got this idea and I thought it would be best to use a, a uh, high grade IBM marketing program to break the news to them. So instead of just telling them I got this crazy idea, it doesn't make sense, but I got to do it. I broke it to them gradually to the point where they thought I was going to I hated my job and would do anything to leave it. Uh, and the further from that, the better. Um, but they went along with it. It was sort of a, a marketing process that took about six months. And then um, I'd actually gone out to California on vacation. I was still working, still training, um, kind of in secret, but they knew all about it. And I got out to my, my brother's house. And the first night I was there, and my parents were there as well. We were having a little rendezvous. And uh, after mom and dad went to bed, I was in the kitchen with my sister-in-law. And she said, okay, Charlie, we need to have a talk. She said, you, your parents are, are just crazy. They're, they're sick. They, your mother's broken down in tears every single night. They've been here. Your father doesn't know what to say to her. He doesn't know what to say to you, but they don't want to interfere. And I realized there, we had a great conversation. Uh, I realized there that that they had done everything they could to support me and didn't want to put any burden on me. But it was a wonderful, loving gesture. And as when we started talking about this, and they said, but, 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 I can still see my mother. And if people know her, like she's not a weeper type, but she, she, she said, but, but, but what, what will the neighbors think? <laughs> and of course, the neighbors thought it was great as long as it wasn't their kid. Uh, and the other thing was that, um, that, that my father said, I don't care what the neighbors think. I think what, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna die, honey. <laughs> you know? But uh, they were still scared and worried and nervous. I would only call home once a week. But once I started the trip, heading south from Mercersburg, night after night, not every night, but several nights a week, people would invite me in, give me supper, let me sit down with their families, call the local newspapers, I'd be interviewed. And, and these people would call my parents or write them and send them letters and say, if you ever come this way, please stop in. Charlie, you know, talk to our Sunday school. He was show and tell at nursery school for our kids or whatever. He's in great condition. He's, he seems fine. He's loving life. Um, we'd, love, we'd love to meet you sometime. And sure enough, spring break the following year, mom and dad on their way to Florida stopped and visited these people. And then they call the local newspaper people. And my mom and dad began to see the rewards of the trip. They began to see it through my eyes rather than just theirs. And I'll go on one step further because I think anybody who's a parent and anybody who's a child, so that pretty much covers the whole group, asks that question as well, Bill. And when I got all the way around to Newport, Rhode Island, um, some friends of mom and dad, they're actually parents of a Mercersburg student, uh, had me to the house and they called the local TV station from Providence. Providence interviewed me, interviewed uh, my dad and my mom. And the guy said, Mrs. Bell, what do you think of all this? What do you think of your son out in the middle of nowhere? He could be dead. He could be shot at. He could be injured. He could be sad. He could be lonely. What goes through your mind as you're sitting there doing the dishes in Mercerville, Pennsylvania? <laughs> and she just took a deep breath. And this is, this is the Rosie Bell that most of you know. She said, I do worry as any mother would, but I remember that when my mother was my age and when her mother, my grandmother was my age, they had sons that were going off to war, World War II and World War I. And I realized that Charlie is merely pursuing a dream and it gives me some comfort wow. knowing how lucky I am. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that, again, their support was, was uh, was an essential part of the whole deal. 
she came up with this right after she quit crying. <laughs> this was this was a while later. <laughs> Once she got to see it on uh, through my eyes, I think. Thanks, Bill. Good to see you. That's you. a great story. Charlie, I'm going to call next on my former student, Natalie Costelny, who is uh, to ask her to unmute and ask her question. And Natalie, I believe, shares something in common with you. She is a journalist now in Philadelphia. So I oh think you two share your love of writing. So you might want to talk about that some. Sure. But uh, <laughs> Natalie, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Well, I can you hear me? We're good? Yes, yes. I can. Oh, good. Well, uh, hello, Charlie. And hey, Jim. Hi. Thank you for inviting uh, me to this. I have a couple of questions. Do you have kids and have any of them done anything like this and asked you permission to partake in this adventure? And secondly, without technology that we have today, how do you plan a trip like this in terms of health and food? I mean, you've explained a little bit of that. Yeah. But um, if you have it, a preference which one first? Uh, the kids one first and yep. the uh, no technology. I, I married late in life. I didn't get married till I was about 40. I proposed in the Mercersburg Chapel. I, uh, we were married in the Mercersburg Chapel. And again, that's a special thanks to, to Walter and Barbara. Um, so our, our, we have two daughters, one who's 20 and one who's 22. And they've never done anything quite like that. But I will say this briefly. Our older daughter, terrific student, could have gone to almost any college there is, not that that's all that important, but she was a great student, very involved in everything. Her great love in life was acting. She uh, applied only to colleges where they had a, M a BFA program in, in art acting. She ended up going to NYU, uh, which was the second, the number two school in the country. Probably Juilliard was number one, hardest to get into. She got into NYU Tisch and into their most exclusive or selective program. And after freshman year, she said she wanted to drop out because being in college was not getting her closer to winning auditions. It was just a terrible expense. And so um, we supported her. We had, uh, I had no recourse, uh, but she's following her dream. Um, in terms of logistics and planning, uh, on the mm -hmm. one hand, it was, uh, it, it was a very uh, improvisational trip. Uh, all I knew at the beginning was that I wanted to touch all the border states all the way around. Uh, I didn't know if, how far down Florida I wanted to go. I didn't know how far into Maine I wanted to go, but, but that was the only sort of criterion. Uh, I knew that I, I could, I'd have a hard time running on interstates, so I'd stick to back roads. Every state, every time I crossed the state line, I would get a new map um, and I would, you know, just plot my course. But the main thing was I'd have a general idea of where I wanted to go next, like from Mercersburg to Washington via Harper's Ferry and the, the towpath. Um, but I was going so slowly that along the way I would ask people, what are good places to visit? What would you want to see? I mean, I was sort of getting guided tours and I would do the crowdsourcing of information for, for where to go. Um, the bigger part of it, the bigger challenge, I think may have been the sort of the mental preparation. But from the time I had that epiphany until the time I set this, you know, did the first step was a, was a year and a half. So I did an awful lot of visualization. And when I talk to, uh, to sports teams, uh, I, it's very easy to talk about the power of visualizing things. Um, people often wondered if I would, you know, was I worried about quitting or something? I said, oh, I can imagine myself in the middle of the desert being very tired, very hot, very dry and sort of exhausted and dirty and not having showers for, for, four or five days and yet running you know, 100 miles without a shower, sleeping in my sweat. But then I thought, you know, I could picture myself putting out my thumb, getting a ride back to the next big city, pulling out my credit card, flying back to Washington. My parents would be thrilled and I'd end up in my bed in Mercersburg waking up saying, why did I quit that? So I had the motivation that sort of uh, drew me on and superseded everything. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I could go on, but I, I have a tendency to go on and on. Sorry. Adam Yang, would you be willing to unmute and ask your question? <laughs> hey, Mr. Malone. Um, I see Mr. Bennett and other group too. Um, <laughs> but um, my question was, um, 
you know, like I, I, I used to run track at the school. So there's always like a loop or part of the run that I really liked. And there's the hills I might really have hated. What was the part of that loop that you really liked? Um, you know, it's a long, long trip. But also I was going to tell Mr. Malone, I got an A plus in physics. So you taught me really well. <laughs> and um, I saw Mr. Bennett. Uh, I, 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 got, I got good grades, but not as well in English. But um, I'm doing well. I'm coming back to the East Coast. So hopefully I'll see you guys soon. <laughs> uh, Angie, I, I'm sorry. Do you want which part physically was the hardest or which I liked the least or yeah, liked the most? Yeah. Yeah, kind of like that, because I know, um, like, I would have hated running across, like, I don't know, New Mexico or Arizona, but I guess, which part did you like the most? The least? The, the most. Oh, the most. The funny thing was, um, I, I probably, the thing I liked the most was being back in Wisconsin, because that reminded me of Mercersburg and New England. I was there in the fall. I ended up being behind schedule, so instead of being there and summer, maybe even late summer, and going around New England in the fall, I ended up going around New England in the middle of winter, and it was 25 below at one point. But the, um, I like places that reminded me of home. But there were a couple places, and if, if you have a pencil and paper or you're typing on your computer, there are two places that shocked me with their beauty that I didn't know about. And one was, the, was Northern California inland, north of Mount Shasta. There's a section called the Trinity Alps, just spectacular. Um, again, if you go on, I will tell you more about my website. It was in the, the mailing, but if you go on the website, you can see some of the, just a little tiny glimpse of the pictures, but I'll be adding more. Um, the other place was in Eastern Washington, this stretch of land called the Palouse, P-A-L-O-U-S-E. I think it's a, I don't know if it's a French word or Indian word, I apologize, but just beautiful rolling fields uh, that are kind of like the fields by Mercersburg but you take that and, and just expand, you know, put it on a balloon and blow it up to 10 times the scale uh, just to see miles of rolling. In fact, if you don't want to listen to me anymore tonight, right now, or on the side, Google P-A-L-O-U-S-E images, and you'll just be stunned by how beautiful it is. So those are two places that were beautiful. As far as hills and flat and everything, I had gotten myself into the frame of mind where I really just had to accept whatever there was, but I did find that long, gradual hills were harder than short, steep ones. Mm. Although the Rockies were pretty steep. Yeah, very good. Okay, Suzanne Dysart, I'm sorry I skipped over you. Why don't you go ahead and unmute and ask your question? It's a very good one. Oh, no worries. So, Charlie, I was curious, what did you do when you finished? And then how was it to acclimate back into normal life? I don't know if you've done something like this, Susan, but you certainly uh, have a great intuition. Certainly the last, well, even from the start of the trip, I wondered what would the finish be like? And then as it got closer and closer, it became more and more um, a greater mystery, even, even as I got closer and closer, but it was also a, a fear, a dread. Um, I even had crazy thoughts like I'm, what I'm gonna do is um, I'm not going to finish it. I'm just going to take a ride the last mile. So the trip will always be unfinished, you know, like the symphony. Um, I also thought of maybe it would be appropriate to sneak home in the middle of the night, the night before I was expected back. I planned to finish with the carol on Sunday afternoon between three and four with uh, the Carolyn and Brian Barker playing Ode to Joy. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just sneak back in the middle of the night and have that moment all to myself. Didn't work out that way. And I won't tell you about the very end, but, but what happened after that was I was, I was very prepared. Oh, it's, just, it's complicated. The next to last day, I had the great epiphany of the trip, probably. Writing about that has, has been a great challenge, but wonderful. And I finally, after 40 years, it's one of the passages that, that I got right. It's the best passage of the whole thing. But what it came down to was understanding, and this is an emotional answer more than what you're asking, I think, but I'm going there anyway. It came to realize that although I was, you know, I was in jail cells, I was on, slept on beaches, I slept on mountains, mountaintops, I slept in an outhouse. I was shot at by drunken cowboys in Texas. I saw this baby born in Louisiana. I saw a child's beloved pet rabbit die. I was right there with him in Idaho. 
on and on and on. I ran through two hurricanes. I ran through a blizzard, got caught in the middle of the desert in, in a blizzard and, and on and on. All these things which make great stories. But in fact, the real power was the accumulation of little moments. And I think about our daughters even, and I told you about um, our older daughter and, and her life, and I can give you a one minute or a five minute or a 30 minute version of her life. But what makes her special is all those little things almost beneath description that, you know, endear people, other people to us. And I realized that even though this trip was going to die in a way, going to end, had to all things come to an end, that those beautiful little moments were there for the taking every day. As anybody who's sort of aware as they go through their lives, you feel the caress of wind, you see the, 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 the wind moving through the grass, you, you see a baby laughing, um, you see someone you know, helping a, a, an elderly person through the store. All these things added up to me to be so much, uh, they were so much richer in, in some than all the, the sort of the superlative stories and moments and memories. And I realized that, that just like a sunset um, and Jen, Jen uh, Flanagan Bradley has a picture of one of the best sunsets of mine. She stole that as a, as a virtual background. But we just like that. the sunset, there'll be another one tomorrow. And as long as you keep your eyes and your heart open to beauty and wonder and magic, it's okay. Then the challenge was, how am I going to share this with other people? Now, they can't do it. And they can follow their own dreams and do their own things. But I really wanted to write about it in all the depth that, that it deserved. And I'm, I can't resist sort of spilling over into this because it's, it's worth sort of describing here. I knew that I could have gone in a week or a month or a year, I could have gone to New York and gone to people in publishing and they would have said, oh, here's this guy who ran around the country, great story. Let's you know, slap it out there, get all the good stories, put them together and this will be fun. Give me a, get, a, get an advance and life will be good. And I realized that I might fall into the trap of writing something that the market demanded. And I would be that guy who ran around the country and that would sort of be it forever. And it was really important for me to take the time to really put people on the inside of the trip and not just tell them stories, but show them what it was like. And uh, it, took me, it took me 40 years. Um, it wasn't until about two years ago that I really felt I'd done it right. So that has been a sort of a defining purpose that has animated me along with my work as a teacher. I was a, a teacher at Hotchkiss. I went back to where I grew up. I actually taught at Mercersburg, coached the girls cross country team in the fall of 84. Yay, Sam Lumby, Sipple, Sipple, I'm sorry. Uh, and anyone else who's out there. Um, but being a teacher, I could enjoy the small things, the, the interactions, the joy of every day. And this bigger vision I had of, of creating the, the master account of it. Uh, kept me going. So thank you for actually asking a really thoughtful question. I hope I answered it. Well, this will be a good follow-up. Leah McConnell, okay, you are up if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Hi, thank you, Mr. Malone. Um, my name is Leah and I graduated Hi, in 2019. Um, and I think you already started to get into a lot of this and it was just amazing to hear you talk about it. Um, but I wanted to ask how you noticed your uh, thoughts change over the course of the run and then also what uh, made starting and ending at Mercersburg meaningful to you. Um, and also just shout out Mrs. Malone, who always <laughs> made such a lasting impression on me, both um, in learning and teaching and chemistry and running most of all. So, and everyone else who have taught me and, and made a lasting impression on me while I was at Mercersburg. Hello. <laughs> um, these are great questions, man. I, I, I think I, I'm not surprised that, that Mercersburg people come up with them, but thank you. Um, yes, my, you know, one of the great joys of the trip, one of the huge blessings was the fact that I had all this time to myself every day. As I was running, I could <clears throat> sort through my thoughts, go wherever they, they led me. When I got injured and began walking, I found out I actually had even more time because I was spending more time to go the same amount of distance every day. But I also wasn't quite as tired as I was running. So the running thoughts tended to be 
um, fleeting and, and jazzy and, and again, sort of improv or something. And it's just little flashes. When I was walking, they could be a little bit more coherent, but still I had this freedom of following my thoughts wherever. And of course, I thought about the usual things, you know, um, love and God and death and, and friendship and, you know, all kinds of philosophical things. But what was interesting was that with all this time to sort through my memories, I was able to remember and, and process much more of what I was doing and, and what I was going through than I had at any time before in my life or since. And there was a time when certainly Southern California where I could replay the entire 4,000 miles of the trip, just like a movie reel, mile by mile at really high speed and go all the way to there. And, and because I had this time to process my memories um, every day and, and go back over them and share stories and stuff, they really became deeply rooted. So the two, two, two more things I wanna say about that really good question that interests me a lot. Um, one is that I think neuroscientists say, and, and I'm not, if there's anyone here who wants to chime in, go ahead. But I think they say the problem usually is not storage of memories, but retrieval. You know, they're in there. If you put a little electric prod, they'll come out. For me, because most of the memories were associated with place, I had a very easy way of recalling them. What was Port St. Joe, Florida like? What was Gila Bend, Arizona or Casa Grande or something? And I could remember the people I met and, and what happened there. When I was deciding to write the book, one of the things I wanted to do was answer this very question. And so it's the, the book's divided into three parts and the middle part or the middle book, if it's published as a trilogy, is the, is the account of a single day from start to finish where I took a tape recorder and recalled everything that I possibly could. Translating that into something that's kind of readable is a big challenge. And it, again, it's something that's taken me so long, happily, but I'll give you one little example and move on. I was, that day that I ended up doing that for was a day in Minnesota. I remember coming around to Ben seeing a tree, not many leaves on it, and it reminded me of a tree back in Texas that I was, that I passed, just kind of staring at uh, in the middle of an afternoon, a gray afternoon, and a car slowed down and there were two teenage kids in the car. And they introduced themselves, you know, where are you going? Do you want to ride? I said, no, I'm okay. And we got to talking. And the next thing you know, he said, well, where are you going to spend the night? And I said, well, I want to reach this next town. And he said, oh, well, we, we live there. Um, and I said, well, where, where should I look for a place to stay? And they right away said, oh, our minister, our youth minister, he's a really good guy. We'll tell him you're coming and, and he'll be nice to you. And they gave me his name. So I thought that's a pretty good chance for the night. Put the backpack on, keep running. And about an hour and a half, two hours later, the same car pulls over coming in the other direction. <laughs> the girl rolls down the window and she just baked chocolate chip cookies for me. Um, this was more the, the sort of the, the, the daily occurrence than, than the exception. I mean, it was the norm. Um, but there I was in, you know, in, in Minnesota, seeing a tree around a bend and suddenly I'm remembering the kindness of these strangers in, in the middle of nowhere. Amazing. All right, let me see here. Uh, Leah, we got to Michael Broder, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Charlie, we're down to six or seven minutes till we start, okay. start running out of time. Michael Broder in from the ski slopes. Michael Broder, are you there? Okay, then we're yeah. gonna move. Yeah, oh, you are, I sorry, am. go ahead. I just, uh... I'm always late. Um, anyway, hey, Charlie. Um, hey, thanks for being here. Well, uh, it's, it's great to hear your, uh, your life and adventures and uh, dreams. So my question really relates to um, what impact did this have on the balance of your life? And I know it's a big question. In other yep. words, what what did, you know, from all of the experiences of being on the road and the people that you met, which is probably most impactful, um, what were the big takeaways? How did that translate into the mm -hmm. rest of your life? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, the big lessons from the trip, again, when forced to condense everything and compress it ridiculously, are, um, 
how good and kind people are fundamentally. Um, and I think it was a human nature thing rather than American spirit thing. I think it was just people wanted to make a good impression. They put themselves in my shoes. They practiced the golden rule, if you will. They reached out and, and, and helped me again and again and again. The second thing is just how big the world is, how each of us has our own little universe wrapped in our, that's in our heads. And it intersects a lot with other people's, but, but there's so much variety out there that that was mind boggling. This was 1979 to 1981. And Michael, you may remember this name and a few other people on the call may, but I found out very quickly, nobody cared about where I went to college or you know, blah, 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 which is all a you know, prep school Northeastern thing. Um, and I found out as a reality, four out of five people I met had never even heard the name Princeton. Now I wasn't going around telling them, but it was just, you know, it was just that there was no association. It meant nothing to them. Whereas, you know, in my world is like, oh, that's a pretty big deal. Four out of five people that I met all the way around the country knew about a place called Lukenbach, Texas. And again, we'll lean, uh, have a show of hands here. I won't be able to see them all, but if you've heard of Lukenbach, Texas, go to that, uh, what do we do, reactions Raise and put hand. your hand up. And I'm guessing that that less than a third, maybe even a lot less than a third have ever heard of Lukenbach. It turns out it was a tiny little country town in Texas that was the home of a, a music festival, sort of like the Woodstock of cowboy music. And people all across the country, guys who worked in garages, people who 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 were checkers at a checkout counter in Ohio, um, guys who worked on the docks in New York City, people who listened to country music knew that that, that was huge. So suddenly realizing that the things that I sort of took for granted just aren't that way. And when you put those two things together, the sort of smallness of, of me or the largeness of the world, along with the goodness of people, it's a pretty heavy, you know, spiritual um, uh, connection. And so the trip was a very profound um, spiritual trip for me. Again, that we could go off in another direction there. Uh, but in terms of affirming my faith in people and in God, it was, it was a, a very real aspect of the trip. In terms of the rest of my life, I think the probably the lesson that was the most significant was simply that I realized, and you know, my trip was a nice metaphor for, for me, but for everybody else, that you can only live your life one day at a time. You can make plans. You can have a sort of arc of your career. That this is what I want to do. I want to marry at this age. And this, but this is kind of how I want my life to live. But you can only live your life one day at a time. And it's important, I think, I thought so, to find something that you find is rewarding, maybe that you're good at, and that makes you happy. Because this whole planning for when I'm going to be the CEO or when I'm going to be a rock star or something, you've got to love music or you've got to really love business. If you don't, you're sunk. And for me, it meant returning to what I had resisted forever. And that was going back into teaching at prep schools. And thanks to Walter for giving me my first job coaching and teaching uh, only for a semester to replace Bo Burbank. Uh, and while while I was doing that at Mercersburg in the 84, 85, Hotchkiss called up. They'd been trying to get me to teach for years. And I kind of said, who wants to do that, man? That's, that's, that's not my thing. Um, and suddenly I went there planning to stay for two or three years and I was there for 34 um, because I found hanging out with teenagers, talking with them, asking questions, listening to them was something that made me happy every day compared to just about anything else I could think of. So I hope that answers the question, Michael. It's a, it's a good one and it deserves a much longer answer. So, so Charlie, we're at time at 8.30 and I, I do just wanna uh, call that out to be respectful of everyone's time. If, if you wanna keep going uh, or if we wanna just make it more social, we can stop recording, we can keep recording. What, <laughs> what do you feel like doing? There's a lot of people here who I'm sure, there's still some questions in the chat too. I've got, I got plenty of energy. This is a great opportunity. Um, and I'd, I'd rather at, you know, answer as many questions as I can than have anyone go home sad. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm happy to have it recorded. If anyone doesn't want it, they can, they can uh, you know, cover their, cover mm -hmm. their screens or, uh, or muffle their voices or something. But uh, 
it, it's fun for me. And, 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 I, and I think people who, who watch the archived version will probably get a kick out of other questions. So Great. fire away. Very good. Okay, Pete Leibovitz, you're up. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Peter. Um, uh, in addition to the question which I put in there, I'd just like to say that I, uh, I ran cross country for the first two or three steps of each practice with Charlie and Lynn and others. Um, Jen's uncle, Tim, taught me where to hide on the way so that I didn't do most <laughs> of the practices. Uh, my, my question, because there has to be a commercial aspect to this, is when can we buy the book and will you sign them for us? Uh, good question. I don't know the answer to it. I will sign every last copy that anyone ever buys as long as my wrist holds out. Um, I will tell you, this is not a planted question, but I'm going to turn to my show and tell briefly and try to, again, keep it short. People wonder why it took so long. And I explained partly that it's just, I, it, I wanted to get it right. Um, early on, I had a couple of articles published and Sue Malone asked me to bring this. This is a Reader's Digest from 1984. Um, Sports Illustrated from, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was also 1984. Uh, my very first publication was Mercedesburg Alumni Magazine. Thank you, Wirt Weinbrenner for editing that. Um, but for the Reader's Digest article, which was about five pages, including pictures, but I won't. People who are, who are new to the world, who are young, may not know what this is. This is a <laughs> folder full of papers. Oops, there it is. Folder full of papers. About 225, 230 pieces of paper. Those were all the drafts to end up with a five-page article in Reader's Digest. So I had to learn to write. I'd been taught pretty well, but to, to do it as well as I wanted was going to take a while. But also, I wanted to reach a point where literally I could open up the book or the books, because it's in three parts. I still haven't told you the details of that, on any page and be happy with what I've written there and not fuss. And so here's here is in uh, loose leaf form, the entire manuscript. Again, about 800 pages. And um, the, the poet in me, and I, I can either thank or blame John Peace, Paul Serkin, and Wirt Weinbrenner. Um, I took uh, independent studies senior year, so I don't have all that. But anyway, uh, the poet in me really likes to get things just right. And this meant so much that it, it just took me a long time. So only within the last six months have I begun the process of trying to find an agent and a publisher. Uh, I didn't wanna do that. I was told to wait until I had a website built. That took some time. Uh, if anyone's there, hasn't seen it, the website is longrun.us. So www.longrun.us. If there's a follow-up uh, email of some kind, that'll be in there. And, and it was probably in the, in the uh, invitation. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard because I was writing a book that I wanted to be as valuable or interesting 100 years from now as right now. If there's somebody in uh, 20, well, let's do the math, 21, 21. Um, and they want to say, what, what were just average people, especially Americans, like back then? What what were people's trains of thought? How did they think? I wanted them to have a chance to do this. And, and I had, you know, nobody had a better opportunity than I did. So there it is. So well, here, if you know anybody you. publishing, let me know. <laughs> I think it's, it's, you know, the first third is very easy reading. Every chapter, there's 21 chapters. Everyone's a best story, jails, outhouse, on and on and on. Um, baby being born, rabbit dying, being shot at, uh, cowboys in Luckenbach, all these things um, with bridging sections in between. But the second part, as I've said, is, is a, kind of a single day from start to finish, free association stream of consciousness, very much influenced by Proust or Joyce or Annie, or Joyce or Annie Dillard. And the third part is a day-by-day -day diary account of the last quarter of the trip from Chicago home. 
And in the first two sections, I was trying to create deliberately a, a sort of a literary tension between the la-di-da adventure stories and then the really in-depth stuff that some of us want to know about. How did your brain change? How did you see the world differently? What was happening step by step? The big tension between the, the uh, super, not superficial, but the, the light and the simple and the easy and the sort of overly heavy. And I think I've accomplished that of sort of building the pace and the level between those two extremes in a way that sort of resolves the tension and balances the picture all the way home. And I finally was able to have the discipline to keep a diary every day and be able to flesh it out when I finally sat down to work. So Peter, <laughs> any, it'll be there when, it, when it's there. Well, um, Charlie, if it doesn't you, work you, out in the next maybe 18 months or so, if I can't find a conventional publisher, I may just go ahead and self-publish, so. Well, um, thank just, you, thank you. You always do do it right. I always learn <laughs> something from you and um, we need to, we need to reconnect. Thanks, Charlie. Thank this you. This is great. Yep. Okay, Ted Smith, who played basketball for me many years ago, and more importantly, is the son of Jim Smith, who many of us know well, uh, has a question. So, Ted, why don't you go ahead and unmute? All right. Hey, hey, Charlie. Hi, Ted. Uh, how how many people have you kept in touch with from the trip, or have you kept in touch with anybody from the trip? Um. Quite a few and more to come. I didn't join Facebook until last uh, August when I launched the website. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of stories. Um, and I have found that as I've reached out to some of the people that I lost touch with, you know, we, we're, we're back in touch. And so I hope to have many more, but I'll give you uh, three quick examples. I'm not really good at quick, but here you guys are. Also, in case Peter didn't sign off yet, I did not run cross country at Mercersburg. Part of my crazy career was I played both football and soccer. I got JV letters in football and I ended up senior year with a varsity soccer team, but I never ran a step cross country because people like Lynn Anderson were just too good and too tough. I, I'm, um, I'm still here, I got it, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't have known if you missed practice anyway, Peter. Um, but getting back to people, they're, they're, I'm going to mention three things. First of all, um, Denise, if you could put up the picture uh, that is uh, at the near the bottom, it, it isn't one of the zero pictures, but it's called uh, Fruges, F R U G E S. And well, she, I hope she has access to that. If not, that's okay. Um, but uh, I don't have that one. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, the the Gumbo family. Um, we've stayed in touch. We lost, so we sort of got out of touch for about 10 years. Um, but this fall, I got back in touch with them. We're friends on Facebook. I'm hoping to go down there for baby Ashley's 42nd birthday um, next December. So we're talking about that. There was a, a family, I mean, sorry, a, a couple of college girls in California. Again, I'd, this is the longest chapter of the trip, but I'll try to keep it really short. One of the hard things about the trip was not being able to sort of have normal fun. By that, I mean sitting around, oh, there it is, you have it. So that's the family that took me in for the gumbo. Um, <laughs> Andre on the left, um, Joanne in the middle and Norman, and they're all doing well. And then the parents are in their eighties. Um, and while we have it, if you wanna just do uh, the gumbo Ashley trio, Denise, um, that again is another one of those, there it is. That was a picture of Mrs. Fruge, uh with baby Ashley. And right there in the scrub down in, in the gown is uh, the dad, Matt. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't go on with too many of these, but th they are real. We've reconnected. And uh, in fact, even yesterday uh, or the day before on my Facebook page, I posted something about the end of the trip. The end of the trip was on March 15th. 1981. So it was 40 years ago, Monday, I think the day was. Um, so I put a post up on that on Facebook and have gotten a lot of responses. Um, but, you know, we went back and forth yet again, trying to reassure each other about the rendezvous. Two more quick stories about people that I met because the people are a lot more interesting than I am. Um, I was talking about college girls. Um, it was very hard to have just sort of a normal, let's have a really nice meal and just have some, have some laughs. 
And in uh, the mountains of, of Central California, uh, I went into a bakery and uh, was, was eating my breakfast and guy came over and sat down with me. Turns out he was the owner of the bakery. He asked what I was doing. We got to talking and he said, well, I want you to meet somebody. And there was a, there was a college girl who worked at the bakery on weekends. So she came over and sat me down. I found out much later that he was always trying to set her up with somebody. But anyway, so she and her roommate invited me to stay with them a couple of days later. I did. We had a great time. They made vast amounts of lasagna. We drank a lot of wine. We're singing in the streets of San Luis Obispo, blah, 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 blah. And near the end of the evening, they asked a very straightforward question. And I ended up telling them a, a long story of my first date ever, a girl I had a crush on back in New Hampshire, who was from California. And I found out when I reached California and wanted to see her again, just for fun, that she was married and living in Connecticut. Um, I later found out, much to my surprise, that I was somebody very special in her life, even though I put her on a pedestal and everything. Anyway, I told these, these uh, two college girls this story and then excused myself to go to the bathroom. I came back into their room and they disappeared. Their living room, nobody, was, they weren't there. They weren't in the kitchen, they weren't in the living room. I went to their bedrooms, even thought they were like doing some weird hide and go seek thing in the closets or something. Couldn't find them anywhere. Finally, I went out on the, uh, went out the front door and they were on a balcony. And one of them was just weeping piteously. And the other one looked at me and said, Charlie, you shouldn't tell such sad stories. And um, I had thought about both of them, as I said, because that chapter is a story within a story. Again, I could go on. It was my favorite, <laughs> my, my cross country teams, especially the girls teams would always want me to tell that story on our four hour bus rides. Um, but I, it was fun. And uh, I'd always thought about them, wondered what happened to them. And I reconnected on Facebook. And immediately I learned that the two of them are still the closest friends in the world. One lives in that same town that I was in the other one where the bakery was, the other one lives in St. Louis, but they talk several times a week. We're all friends. And so immediately they said, well, you got to read us the chapter. So we had a three-way Zoom call and uh, one of them was at work. The, the one who was, who'd wept was at work. The other one was at her home in St. Louis. And I read the chapter start to finish and I got to the end and we were all three, <laughs> all three of us were in tears. Um, so it's, it's uh, wonderful to reconnect like that. The final thing is that um, in the 1990s, I was telling stories on Connecticut Public Radio, one story a week for about, for almost a year, 43 episodes, I guess, just three minute things a week. And on Easter Sunday, I got a phone call from a guy who said, is this the Charlie Bell is telling stories on Connecticut Public Radio? And I said, yep. And he said, um, well, we met blah, 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 um, in North Carolina, in Virginia, North Carolina. So I met him. He was one of the few people I met by accident twice on the trip, 150 miles apart. He'd see me running up a hill while he was riding a bicycle and just yelled, where are you going? Where are you running? And I said, I'm running all around the country, one big lap. End of story. A couple of weeks later, I'm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, walking down the street. And this guy comes up to me and says, excuse me, you're running a lap around the United States, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, you remember that guy on the bicycle outside of Manassas, Virginia? I said, sure. So we talked for a few minutes and that was it. And I, I took down his name and address so I could send him a postcard when I was done. I did that for many people. This is uh, 11 pages of tiny handwriting uh, for about a thousand people of the 20,000 people I met. Anyway, so I did send him a postcard. I forgot about that. He had, he had moved from North Carolina to Connecticut for, for work, for his wife. It turns out he had uh, daughters who were bookended by my daughters. They became very good friends and playmates. Um, he's the godfather of our younger daughter. Um, so, uh, and he's the person actually who, who create, he's a video producer and he's the one that produced the video on my website, longrun.us. Be sure to subscribe. It makes publishers think that I'm actually, uh, I've got an audience out there. I posted it in the chat. I'll post it Great. again. Thank you. Okay, Emily Rowe, would you be willing to unmute and ask your interesting question? Mm -hmm. 
Emily Rowe, are you there? Maybe she's not there anymore. Okay, I'm gonna jump down to Emma Delilah who has a question which is technically interesting to me. So Emma, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Uh, it's actually my dad's question, so. <laughs> Hi, Dick. Hey, how are you? Good to see everybody. Lots of old friends there. Don, Dave Tyson, um, the Bergens. Dave's here. Hi, Dave. <laughs> yes, uh, Dave is here. So the, the, the question, we, my daughter pulled up the, the website and, and looked at those wonderful pictures. You were taking your own photos as you were walking. Yeah, right I, did not have a, I did not have a sponsor. I didn't have a support crew. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a cause. Um, I really wanted to do it independently. And uh, I had a little camera it, it, and I took 35 millimeter slides. It was the camera's about a size of a, a, are we allowed to say a cigarette carton? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it was a mini Minox 35 millimeter, but I took Kodachrome 64 slides. It took about, a, uh, we'll just round it off to a thousand, 1200 of them. And Kodachrome is totally stable, lasts forever. Yeah. And uh, although I showed them as a slideshow from time to time, finally, when I retired, uh, two years ago, I went ahead and got um, my 500 favorites digitized. So did and you I do, I would say I have 500, which are really okay. good. Um, good enough to, you know, sort of publishable quality. Um, the ones that you've seen uh, that, that Denise put up are, are not, they were part of storytelling. They weren't great, but uh, I have a lot of good ones that show people and places. There are very few pictures of me um, cause it was before selfies and all that stuff. But uh, so did you, did you develop them along the way or did you wait? No, until I would send them back to my dad. Um, in fact, if Denise, are you still with me? Yeah. If you could put up the, uh, this is one of the O ones, ocean spring shoes, ocean spring shoes. So before I left, I bought 10 pairs, identical pairs of shoes. And uh, my father was going to send them to me as I wore them out. And indeed, the first pair had to be replaced. If you could see, if you could zoom in on that, which you can't, it's uh, Ocean Springs, Mississippi. So he'd send them care of general delivery, uh, Ocean Springs, Mississippi. And you can see a fresh pair of socks there along with the old ones. Um, and much to my father's surprise, I packed up the old shoes and they were like as disgusting smelling as they look. And those are the exact same things, bright yellow versus gray. Um, so I, I turned the package inside out, put the stamps on and send it back to mom and dad. They're so excited, like, oh, Charlie's sending us a package. And sometimes I would send letters or diary entries or souvenirs or, you know, mementos. They opened it up and it was, they had to fumigate the house. Um, but anyway, I would also send canisters of film back and they would develop them. So I did not get to see the pictures until I finished the trip which was a great bit of excitement. And it answers one of the questions from a while ago about finishing the trip. That was something to look forward to. But I also looked forward to the challenge of writing about it. I knew it was gonna be hard and scary um, and daunting, but, um, but it was cool. And, and right behind me, if we can, we can get out of that, Denise, and go back to the regular picture. Right behind me, you may have seen over in the corner here. Oh, I'm gonna, I'll zoom out a little bit to show you the way I've set up my, um, like over, you can see the map behind me, but over here is the backpack. And right here on top is one of the pairs of shoes. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's retired with honor or Ocean Springs, Mississippi. So this is pair number one. You can see how the heels got worn down. Uh, I ended up being on my seventh pair when I finished. And uh, so I had a couple This is again, identical shoes. They were the state of the art back then, Adidas runners. This is a brand new one. This is after maybe 1500 miles or so. Um, but I was very lucky to have the film thing back then. Um, somebody asked a question a while ago um, that I never did answer. And that was about how would it be different now? Well, it was, the question was about planning. And um, I think I answered the planning. It was like, I just needed to carry what I could carry. Um, well, I think that's a little too close. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Um, 
senior moment. Senior moment. Yep. Anyway, but I, I answered the, the planning part. Next question. If there are okay, any, uh, very to... quickly, my this one shouldn't take too long. My good friend Jackie Sweeney wants to know how you ended up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jackie, uh, I will not tell you all five stories because they're five different places in Port Saint in uh, in Georgia, Florida, um, Texas, Illinois, and uh, Rhode Island. But the very first one happened in Georgia. And as I often did when I was getting my saltine supper at a grocery store, as I went through the checkout line, I would ask the, the cashier if there was a place where I could put down my sleeping bag and not get in trouble. Uh, they kind of look at me funny because they were usually high school kids earning some spare money. And so uh, this was no exception. She kind of looked at me, what do you mean? I said, well, it's kind of a long story. I'm traveling from Pennsylvania all around the United States on foot. I don't take rides. Um, I just have a sleeping bag in a tent. I want to put it down, be safe, don't want to get in trouble. She said, well, I don't know. Um, and then somebody behind me said, you know, uh, what you're doing is pretty cool, but around here, uh, the police can be kind of rough on you. So if they catch you, you don't know what that's going to be like. So I have a cat that I have to get out of my special shoes. <laughs> and, um, so they said, you should probably check with the police. So I checked and went to the police station, which was actually a little trailer, a mobile unit. And uh, on the desk there was a high school kid probably earning his uh, merit badge for public safety or something. Most officious kid I ever met. He uh, hears my story, gets on the horn and goes, uh, Chief, is Edmund here. Uh, we got, a, we got a, a wandering young man who needs a place to spend the night. I... Uh, I don't have any authorization or jurisdiction to adjudicate such a situation. So I reckon you better come back to headquarters. You know, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, Roger. And then I'm sitting in a on a sticky seat in a in a corner of a police station. This is just a trailer, and uh, the flies are buzzing and the fluorescent lights are flickering and all that. And then after a while. Screen door bangs open, and in walks this guy who looks like a character of a small town Georgia cop. 250 pounds if he weighs an ounce. He's pitted out down to his gun belt. Um, got a belly hanging over the, the front. And he grabs a chair, spins it around, slams it down in front of me and goes, so what's your story, boy? <laughs> I said, well, sir, my name's Charlie Bell. And, blah, blah, blah. and uh, I was just didn't want to get in trouble. and want to put my sleeping bag down. He goes, so you're looking for a place to crash, is that it? And I said, uh, yeah, I guess so, sir. And he said, well, I reckon unless you got any objections, you'll be spending the night right here in our jail cell. And I didn't know whether he meant like, if you have a problem with that, you're on your own, or if he meant you're spending the night right here in our jail cell. And I didn't want to guess wrong. So I said, oh, oh, thank you. That would be, that would be great, appreciate it. <laughs> and he goes, uh, Edmund, Remember that hippie we had come through here last summer? Get out the release forms. A, you understand we have to protect ourselves. And I'm signing, a, next thing you know, I'm signing this piece of paper that says that if I lose a limb or if I die while in their custody, <laughs> it's my own fault. And the deputy takes me to the jail cell. So it turns out the jail cell is in the basement of a courthouse. There was an Andy Bone courthouse, like 150 years old, crumbling bricks, and I'm down in the basement. And it was just disgusting. Um, then they they slammed the door on me and locked it up, and that was it until the morning. Um, there were other places where they were a little more uh, agreeable, but to see who was in jails, you know, in small towns, and to hear the police interact with their uh, their uh, citizens was uh, real eye opening. Very good. Okay, so Emily, like wrote, that's going to be a really good story. Thanks, thanks, Charlie. That was great. <laughs> there are a lot more. <laughs> yes, uh, Emily Rowe tells me good that to see she you guys. Did not get her mic unmuted, so I'm going to go ahead and read her question to you because it's an interesting one. You have spoken about imagining your path, for example, diving into the Pacific after running across the country, or pulling out your credit card and turning home. Did you find that your run paralleled what you envisioned? Uh, from a logistical standpoint, 
Yes, I had spent a lot of time doing that visualization ahead of time saying I could be really tired and hungry and so on, but I was going for, you know, gold medal glory for lack of a better phrase. And so that I knew that from a logistical standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, um, again, I thought it would be my gold medal dreams that would, you know, my ambition that was going to keep me going. And what I found out was what kept me going was the kindness of the people, just this, this sort of embrace that I was feeling. And yeah, there were some places where it didn't work out too well, um, but I, it, it, it was a, a wonderful surprise. And, and, you know, I would literally be with someone like Mrs. Fruge. She, she wasn't, but being hugged goodbye with a woman with a little tear in her eyes. And I say, well, when she goes, I just can't imagine what's gonna happen to you. I don't know how your mother did it. And I said, well, you know, the next town I'm gonna find somebody just as kind and friendly as you. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know their names, you know, when I get home and so on. So that, that kept me going. Um, and I'll give one, another story popped into my head about all this. I remember going through the middle of the night in, in, uh, in Wisconsin, it was, the second winter was coming, it was getting cold, frost was on the ground. I was, was, was praying like I need to find a place to stay, but it was farm country and everything was spread out. And I knew the next town was another six or seven miles and I just wasn't prepared to go that far, but my tent wasn't warm enough and everything. So I was like praying like, well, I need a miracle here. And this is again, like something from a movie, come over a crest of a hill and there's this beautiful white church all lit up, a little tiny country church, but white spire and everything. And I'm going like, oh my God, answered prayers. And you know, and I'm, and I'm walking up to it, I'm walking up and I get to the front door and it's locked. <laughs> it's a Saturday night and it's locked. So I go around to the side door, locked, locked, locked everywhere. And then I finally realized that out and back was an outhouse. So I thought, okay, it's an outhouse for a church. How many people are going to be using this in a given week? Now, nobody's going to go to church and say, oh yeah, I got to go to the bathroom while the, you know, right before church starts. So I thought it's going to be pretty clean. So I go in there and sure enough, it was warm enough and wide enough. And, and I settled in there and got a nice little picture of it, which I don't, uh, I don't think I included, but it's on the website for sure. Um, next morning, I'm sort of stretching and loosening up and the bells start to ring and there's a nine o'clock service. So I figured, what the heck, I just go in and sneak in the back. And the minister gets up and in the middle of the sermon, he's talking about the story of Lazarus. And there are a couple of Lazaruses in the Bible, but the one he was talking about is um, there's a rich man and then his uh, servant Lazarus. And the rich man, isn't, he's, in, he's not a very nice guy. He dies and he goes to hell. But Lazarus, the, the servant, goes to heaven. And so the, the rich guy's in, in torment in hell and he goes, um, Lazarus, please come bring me cold water to, to parch my thirst. Uh, <laughs> and then God says, too bad, Lazarus, you blew it. You know, you had your chance while you were alive, but uh, it's too late now. And the minister goes, and so we all know the lesson of this story, don't we? And he said, we could, we could go through our lives oblivious to other people. And we could go through our lives being good people. But if we don't reach out and help people, we're not the people we could be. And God will deal with us. You know, and then all of a sudden he goes, how many of you saw that young man outside the church who had to sleep in a tent outside the church because we kept it locked? The house of God, we kept locked from this young man. And he didn't know I was in there. <laughs> he didn't know I was in there. All the people around me, they knew because of the smell and everything, but they're kind of looking around. And I go, uh, like that. And he goes, it's enough to say maybe maybe his life is difficult and somehow he should be helped. But it's not enough just to think it. We need to act. The next time that the Board of Deacons get together, maybe we should revisit that decision. Maybe we should think it would be best, the right thing. What God wants us to do is to leave these doors unlocked. And I, and I really wanted to put up my hand and say, well, you know, if you just put a heater in the outhouse, that, that would be great. But... Um, you know, again, the, the, the moments go on and on and on. All right. Okay, Charlie, we have arrived, I believe, at the last question in the last chat. Last question. It is from my former student, Marka Armstrong Yui from the class of 1985. I know, Marka. So, Marka, go ahead and ask away. Thank you, Jim. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Um, Good this to see you. 
Yeah, it's lovely to see you as well. And actually, I have Sam to thank because she was the one who emailed me and said, hope I see you on the call. Wonderful. Um, so it, this has been brilliant. And it's been a gift, I think was the word Katie used. And in so many ways, yep. uh, it's been a gift to see all of these amazing people on the phone. And I've had as much fun in the chat <laughs> <laughs> catching up with classmates and teachers as I have listening to you. So Good. thank you. My, my question is this, you've had such- Thank you for not saying experience. you had a better time, but you know. What's that? Thank you for not saying you had a better time catching up with people. No, no, no. <laughs> I've, I've, you know, I've been doing this multitasking thing, which apparently is not something we're capable it's of. Zoom life. Trying. Um, so you've had this incredible experience and here you are 40 years later writing about it. Uh, you mentioned your mom and dad a number of times, and you know, I'm fortunate to have met your, met your parents. How did it change your relationship with them? And not just with them, but then with your friends and those colleagues that you had at your big corporate job. You know, you come back, a lot of times people say they climb a mountain or they go on a run or they do whatever, they, 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 they live in a third world country, and they come back and they're not the same person necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then how they interact with others change. So I'd love to get your perspective on how perhaps it changed you and how it influenced those important relationships. Yeah, good, good questions. It always come, it all, it almost always comes back to mom and dad. And then if we're mom and dads, there's that. But um, Denise, while you're doing this for people who may not know them, if you could do, um, if you could put up mom and dad first day. And then after that, it's been up for a while, then home. And if you forget which they are, mom and dad, first day, and then home, the last day. Um, I don't think it changed the relationship much. They were always supportive. They were always loving. They were always proud of me. Um, and I think the most important thing was that even though there was a part of me that had resisted going into teaching and following in dad's footsteps, I think when I, after my several years of trying to get my thoughts down on paper to debrief myself, because I, uh, I finished the trip in 81 and living, eating, again, canned beans, cold beans for three years and, and house sitting wherever I could. I, it wasn't until 80, fall of 84 that I started helping out and coaching and then teaching that spring. But when I went back into teaching and discovered that, that that was really what was best for me, I think it, it just sort of completed the circle. So, um, so there wasn't a, a, a dramatic change. I think they just felt like, okay, Charlie's, Charlie's good. Um, we're, we're fine with all of that. Um, in terms of my own change, as I think it still came down to my, uh, during the run, affirming that fact in such a concrete, tangible way, again, that we can only live our lives one day at a time. And sometimes if you do have a big plan, you have to do stuff that you don't like much on a route to whatever that thing is, that goal, that ultimate destination. But for me, it was, there was sort of an existential quality of it's really important to be uh, having the time and energy and the situation to appreciate the small things in life. And for me, it was a I needed to do a people-centered job. As far as my colleagues, my coworkers, um, they were absolutely thrilled. And I have to tell you, this is giving away the, the first full chapter of the book is called Fairfield. And the first half is when I talk about getting the idea for the trip, but the second half or the middle of it is telling my parents the news. But the third part is my farewell luncheon at IBM. <laughs> and this will encapsulate everything in, in, uh, in just a vignette. So um, whenever anyone left, it was a very sort of depressing affair, you know, sort of mixed feelings, happy for you, but sad to see you go. And with me, I had not told anybody what I was going to do. I'd, I'd created, again, this marketing lie that I was going off to business school. And they got me a really nice Mark Cross leather, you know, really fairly high-end leather portfolio for business school. That's what I unwrapped. I said, oh, this is going to be really great. And I thought, well, I'll keep early drafts in this, but didn't tell them. Anyway, so um, the the luncheon was was just dying out it was a miserable restaurant it wasn't a super nice one um 
sort of smelly and smoky and th everyone was kind of depressed and people were looking at their watches thinking is it late enough that i could sneak home now if it's, you know it's 2 30 the salesman could take off and um i thought well i guess i might as well do it so i was at the head of the table and there were about 20 people you can picture it a dingy manhattan av absolutely average restaurant sort of a family restaurant with big chunky crystal glass water goblets. And I leaned forward and said, um, I guess this is about as good a time as any to let you know that uh, my plans for the next two years aren't exactly what I've led you to believe. And all of a sudden the place was just dead silent and every face turned to look at me. And I said, uh, and this was the last day of May, I said, uh, Starting as early as August 1st or as late as September 1st, I'm going to be back in Pennsylvania, my parents' house. I'm going to put on a backpack, running shoes, and I'm going to run a lap around the perimeter of the continental United States. And again, absolute silence for a second. And then the lead salesman on the team yelled, I'm buying the next round. <laughs> And everybody got totally re-energized. We were there for another two hours with people peppering me with, with questions. Um, they were so excited. They knew I was dead serious. Um, they couldn't, you know, they were, they, they, they were just happy for me. They wanted to live the trip vicariously. When I got to Montana, I was the, the uh, featured speaker at a mid-year sales meeting. Uh, they did it by stealth where they said they were gonna, it was sort of a skit, they were gonna have a, a typical customer, you know, you're gonna have, a, and it was all this funny. And then they come on and I disguised who I was for three or four minutes. And then suddenly said, and so I got this guy here. He says he's for, I'm from IBM and he's our customer service representative. He doesn't know his butt from his elbow, but maybe I should put him on. He can explain himself, Charlie Bale. Like, and all of a sudden they go, oh my God. So only two or three people in the branch knew about it. And again, the questions just flowed for a long time. When I got back to New York, uh, just before the end of the trip, the last two or three weeks, they had me, uh, you know, go in front of the group and again, have a, a, a weekly sales meeting, you know, a branch meeting for a couple hours. And then after it was all done and I got the slides back, uh, I came back, they wanted to see the slideshow, the whole thing. So um, they, they couldn't have been more excited living it, you know, living through me vicariously. And it was, it was wonderful. Because again, you know, I think a lot of people when they hear about it, it's like, as long as it's not my kid, that's as long as I'm my kid, that's really fun. So, and then they were right. It was. Wonderful. Thank you, Charlie, for that. Okay. I want to say thank you to Charlie, to Jim for moderating. So, and Sue too, you were too quiet, Sue. Thank you. I know you're, you're on mute. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that we wrap up our evening. Um, Charlie, I'm happy to leave the room open for anyone who wants to just informally chat with you. We'll stop recording, but uh, thank you for being part of our Distinguished Reunion speakers. Oh, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you'll join in some of the other events that are coming up. You can find the full slate on our website at mercersburg.edu slash events. Um, I think our next Distinguished Reunion speaker event is April 15th, a celebration of some of our uh, alumni who are working in the uh, field and industries related to STEM. Uh, so hope you'll join in. Thank you again, Charlie. Uh, Just for my last word, I, I thank you all. Um, when I was on the road, I was overwhelmed by the small kindnesses of people. I learned, you know, sort of ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find. So I will take the opportunity to say, please check out the website and sign up. It'll help me maybe get an agent and a publisher. Also, if you have a, a church group, a school, a business, whatever, and you're looking for a little bit offbeat entertainment, I can probably keep my sh stories shorter, but I'm happy to go uh, as long as I can. But you can find the contact information there. But I do find that uh, it's a very lonely path, a much lonelier path now that I'm following than I did before. And I rely on other people again to, to reach out and, and give me a little bit of a hand to be more visible and to share the stories that obviously I love to tell.
So if you haven't you. watched, if you haven't watched Charlie's video on his website or check, checked it out, I highly recommend that you do. It's, it's incredible. Thank you, Charlie, for sharing Thank your you. story. Thanks for everyone for coming.